Please welcome Bob Hartline, Chief Sustaining Engineer for Universal Orlando. Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for uh, inviting me. I, my pleasure to be here. Um, my name is Bob Hartline. I'm the Chief Sustaining Controls Engineer. I'm a technical guy. I talk about uh, control systems and how we make things move and uh, lights flash and sound come out of things and that sort of thing in the parks. Um, what I'm going to talk about today, if all this works, oh, they left it. Fancy, huh? Uh, innovation through partnerships. In other words, how to, how to succeed in innovation with partnering with uh, outside vendors or uh, commercial off-the-shelf products. Um, I would have learned being here today that, you know, if we were talking about uh, spacecraft, apparently commercial off-the-shelf spacecraft are available, so I guess I'm done. <laughs> so just buy one. Anyway, uh, <laughs> so we're going to talk about a few things. Uh, the first part is why is this a good idea? And I know that, you know, COTS is the you know, commercial off-the-shelf uh, is, has been uh, the topic for many years, and, and everybody kind of has the general reasons why you do that, and they pretty well still hold true today. You know, you, you've got reduced development cost because uh, you don't have to recreate the wheel. Uh, the diversity and third-party certifications, well, we're talking about there is, you know, there's a lot of different products out there, and, and now the technology has advanced in very recent years to where now we can buy systems where somebody else is doing a lot of the legwork for us, more than normal, to the point that we're getting a third party like a TUV or somebody like that to tell us that this component is safety rated. So when you're, you're building safety rated systems, and we all, we all are in that business, uh, you know, we can take a lot of that workload off of ourselves because somebody else is now doing that. Uh, that's important to me because in, in, you know, in my business, uh, you know, we, we run theme park and we do attractions. We, uh, uh, it's a little different. You know, our systems, most of our systems are life safety rated. Uh, you know, the little difference between us and maybe you guys is, you know, you have trained people on your machine and you've got trained people operating in the console, you know, uh, and you put them on the machine and they, they, they go somewhere. You know, we get Ma and Pa Smith from Kansas that have uh, saved up for bringing their family for that once in a generation trip to a theme park for the experience, and they get on the ride, and at best, I hope they really read the sign that said keep their hands, arms, and legs in the vehicles at all time, and that they remember that when they get on, because they don't know anything else, they don't, don't know what to expect, so we have to put them on this machine, and you know we, we can't rely on them to help us operate the machine. So one of, our, one of our things we have to deal with is what can they do for us or against us to mess up our machine, what can our machine do to mess up them, and we have to protect against that. We do functional testing, functional safety testing for everything. You, know, you have trained operators at your launch control system. I have uh, high school kids. And they're trained. They know what to do and they know what's going on. And, uh, but but you know, it just puts more of a reliance on the system to do the work. So the way, and the way we operate our systems, basically, is um, I'll go ahead and pop these up here and I'll just run down them a little faster. Um, the, the way we do our systems is we have to buy off-the-shelf equipment, just like, you know, we used to say nobody built a rocket, but I guess apparently, again, people are. But, the, but you know, when we do theme parks, uh, you know, the mechanism that we put you on and move you is a machine that generally exists somewhere else in the world, somewhere else in industry. And what we do is we take two or three or four different pieces of that machine or two or three different four or five pieces of, of a different machines, stick them together, and we make a new machine. Okay, and then we stick you on the end of it, and then we send you around. And, and we do this where we have to do it, sometimes we do it as often as every uh, 15 seconds we cycle equipment. So we've got equipment that'll cycle, in some cases, a million times a year. But when we, when we go to do that, we buy this stuff uh, from other people because we don't have the, uh, uh, the, really the funding and stuff to go invent this stuff from scratch, nor do we normally have the time frame because usually we're in a bit of a rush if somebody comes with an idea to, to build an attraction based on a particular intellectual property right, we take off and run and we get it done. And, and that's about a, it's typically about a three year turnaround from, from concept to the, the, to the day we get it open. Uh, but, but we have to go buy these parts from uh, manufacturers. Um, when we do that, we, uh, uh, we go long and hard and deep into the, to, to the guts of their company to find out how they work and what they do. Uh, and, and what we learn of things like this is, 
you know, manufacturers have better availability to parts. So when you have, uh, you, you don't think about that normally, but when you have something like a tsunami hit Japan and the only uh, manufacturing facility is now you're down to one that makes a, a thin film capacitor or something like that, well, the guy that's buying, you know, four million of them a year is going to beat the pants off of you when he goes over and places his order compared to you wanting a couple dozen for something uh, or whatever the component may be. So they have that. Uh, inventory and training and maintenance, when you go off the shelf with industrial products that are out there today, you know, inventory now for standard products is held by distributors as well as you can do consignment. You have factory stock and everything else. So you're not custom building a bunch of these things and putting them on your shelf and, and dealing with that cost. And as far as the training goes and maintenance cost, same way that you have factory training available on the items. And what we've, what we've learned over the time is um, as things have gotten better and technology has improved, now things are now we can take more things off the shelf and do more things with them because now things have more connectivity. I can take this box and talk to that box and talk to this sensor, and I can sh exchange an awful lot of data. And I, can, and I can get all the information I ever wanted to know and more, and I didn't have to invent a thing. So from the process, from the, the one box that's, that takes off and does the operation over here all the way over to the display screen over here that gives me, that's all off the shelf now. People are doing this in other industries you know, not just, uh, you know, not just what we do, but pharmaceutical industries, you know, petrochemical, all this stuff. They need all that same information. Manufacturing's now wanting to trace all the raw products, how much they use, how much they're producing an hour, what their yields are. They want all that same kind of information. The information's now there. It's free. It's available. And you can get to it and you can use it. The, um, we have smart devices now which plug and play. We just run one cable to something, we get up online, it tells us what it is and we can control it. Um, another thing for security, that's, a, that's become a big issue. If anybody knows the word Stuxnet from a couple of years ago, uh, for industrial control systems and automation systems, it was malware that was got into a uh, control system. It was designed for one control system. We won't talk about it was for because it was actually a cool thing, but it messed it up, which is all good. But it brought to the attention of the, of the hacker community, which, which after now for the last couple of years of spending a lot of time researching that, we have learned that uh, the, hacker, the hacker community is pretty uh, diverse, but that's been brought to the attention that, that these machines that, that control things and make things happen, uh, make things move, uh, do not normally have any kind of protection on them or really don't have a methodology protection because that's not what they were designed to do. They were designed to turn things off and on and make things, you know, control machinery. So hackers have now decided that this is the fun thing to do. It's a fun thing to take over a water treatment plant. It's a fun thing to take over the power grid. It's a fun thing to take over control of a roller coaster. It's a fun thing uh, now to go down the street and change the readings on your power meter because you now have a wireless power meter on your house and you get an electric bill for $15,000 because somebody thought that was funny. You know, th these guys are hacking and doing everything. So. We've learned that you know, with a commercial off-the-shelf equipment, because of the common protocols, we can use that technology to protect itself uh, a lot simpler than you could do if you had some pro proprietary protocols. Uh, we've actually done a system, developed a system that we're starting to implement now that I can say I, I had a part of that we uh, actually have a patent going forth with my name on it that detects changes into security system and into the security of our uh, of any kind of automated control system. So we're, we're, we're getting there and making great headways. Things have changed dramatically in the last, I would say, three to five years as far as the technology and what you can do with what you can buy off the shelf. Um, another thing is technology life cycle. You know, I'm sure you guys fight the same battles around here with obsolescence that we do. Uh, over the years, you know, we used to say things were good for 10 to 15, maybe 20 years on the outside. The life cycle now in technology from, uh, from uh, manufacturers is basically three to six years. And then in the next 10 years, they expect it to be three years is about all you're going to get out of something. All they expect that they'll support it. You know, look at uh, Microsoft, obviously, and uh, Windows operating systems. You know, they, they, just, they, they always, the new answer is just go buy the new one. But sometimes if you've got a, a uh, you know, Windows uh, 2000 machine and you want to put Windows 8 on it, now you have to go buy the new computer to go with it, right? So they don't really care about that, but they're just going to tell you to buy a new one. So technology life cycles are changing quickly. And, and again, with new, uh, newer technologies, manufacturers are starting to move forward with backwards and forwards compatibility so that you don't have to do this 
uh, uh, complete hardware replacements. You can, you can stay in one platform and, and migrate without starting all over again. And uh, Again, with that, we'll just go with a bit back what I just said there, same thing, I'm, I'm gonna repeat myself. So where to start? You gotta determine your uh, functionality requirements, obviously, that what you're gonna build. Whether it's uh, safety and reliability are always number one in my industry, and I'm sure the same thing for you. We have to, uh, you know, we run Central Florida theme parks last year according to the internet, because we don't release official numbers, but I'll say the internet, which would always be true, uh, says we moved about 60 million people through Orlando theme parks last year. And, and that's an awful lot of people coming to ride rides and rides attractions and take that once in a uh, lifetime experience, and they all, want, they all want the difference experience where they're over at Disney or they're seeing us or they're at SeaWorld. Um, so uh, those safety requirements that you're gonna set forth, operational requirements, maintainability, uh, you, have, you have to know what your baseline is for that. Your requirements for functional safety and certification are not gonna change whether you do it yourself or whether you're gonna go off the shelf or partially off the shelf. And to go examine similar applications in like industries. You know, whatever your process may, may be, there's a very good opportunity some piece of it is done in a similar fashion somewhere else, whether it be petrochemical or pharmaceutical or even the theme park industries. Uh, Jeff from Disney and I were commenting you when know, we were touring some of the back areas here that the back areas here look an awful lot like our back areas. You know, a lot of similar equipment, a lot of types of things. You know, we do, we do uh, in some cases, we do a controlled explosions uh, by dumping natural or LP gas inside of buildings. We do it every 30 seconds. We, we dump liquid nitrogen. We dump carbon dioxide. We dump high pressure steam. We dump large volumes of water. We have to monitor oxygen content in the, in the buildings to make sure that people uh, come out still breathing on the other side. We have to do biodynamic testing and monitoring all the time. Our, our, our systems are much more powerful than you expect. They're, I mean, they have, we typically run them at, you know, we don't run them at full blast, so they have the capability of, of you know, moving some body organs around if we shake you around too much. So we have to make sure that we do that same thing right every time. So there's a lot of similarities to do, but we do this all with off-the-shelf products. Um, so there's a, there's a fair amount of similarities. I will say this, and this I cannot stress enough, success uh, in getting this done is, is, is purely in the details. It's all about uh, uh, dotting the I's and crossing the T's uh, and taking the time to do it right. When you start dealing with outside manufacturers, you will find out that they are all not created equal. Uh, I'll, I'll say that when we, when we deal with technology and vendors that sell us technology, I classify them as two, in two different categories. Uh, there are manufacturers that make a technical product and they are out to strive to make the best technical product. There are manufacturers that are out there to strictly go for price point and volume. How many of these can I make, okay? So, and, and, and that being said, not all parts are created equal. Not all sales engineers and support people and designers are the same as well. You know, when we deal with sales engineers, I find, I find in my 30 years of doing this that I deal with the same small group of people. It doesn't change a whole lot. So uh, anybody outside that group that, that really just wants to sell me something so they can say they sold something to me or they sold something to NASA so they, it's a uh, mark on their card or the report to the main office, I call those guys peddlers. So either a sales engineer and, you're, and you have as much interest in making this project successful as I do or, I, or we don't deal with you. Um, you're not going to do this on price point. It's not going to be the cheapest part because, again, people market stuff to see how, how many they can sell for how cheap they can sell. But you'll find when you compare components and like electrical component, when you go look at the specifications and the details, one guy's got 30 volt isolation. The next guy, he's $10 more, but he's got, he's got 600 volt isolation. So again, it's all to the details of getting it right. Rarely will you ever be successful with one manufacturer across their entire product line, despite what they tell you. You will, you will get a manufacturer and they'll tell you they sell you everything from one end to the other and it's the best made ever. They all do some things better than others. And some guys are better at one product and other guys better at another product and you will figure out how to match them up despite the fact they tell you they won't work together. So a lot of things we come up and do, when we come up and do it, the manufacturer, you're gonna do what with it? Because it's just never been done before. Or they'll tell you, you can't do that. And we say, why can't we do that? And it's just, well, it's just never been done. Doesn't mean you can't do that. When you when you get dealing with these guys and you, we set up a mutual non-disclosure agreement so we can share 
our needs and they can share all their deep secrets because we're wanting to know what's coming out next year because we can influence that because when we start looking at product, we can say, you know, if you made this one little change, which, which in, in, the, in the product development stage means absolutely nothing to them, if you made this one little change, we could do this. And when we do this, now it's great and I'm one up on the guy down the street. We have friendly competition with the guys down the street, but we always uh, one up each other. I got my secret projects, he's got his secret projects. So anyway, do that. Uh, audit processes and certifications of manufacturers to make sure that they're doing what they're telling you they're gonna do. Because uh, not everybody's straight up on that either. Uh, I always, always tell you, it's uh, listen to the words they use when they tell you, because it's the words they don't say is what they're not telling you the rest of the story. When they leave something out of a sentence, when you ask a question, you don't get the direct answer. You know, it's, uh, that's always a true tell uh, sign of uh, what they're up to. So uh, I'm, I'm not a very trusting guy for vendors. I beat them all to death. <laughs> so anyway, I, again, I appreciate you guys having us here. And um, I think that's it for now. Thank you.